How you doing guys, welcome to another episode, option B, biochemistry, volume 2, where we're still looking at proteins and enzymes. Let's get straight to it. Okay, biochemistry, 2B, proteins and enzymes. We have a discussion about enzymes and enzyme activity. We refer back to Zwitter ions and we look at protein separation. IB understandings and applications still come from 2B, where we finish off looking at proteins and enzymes. Okay, so what is an enzyme? An enzyme is a protein that acts as a biological catalyst. We say that an enzyme has generally more than 200 amino acids joined together. They're very specific and they usually only catalyze one type of reaction. And that comes from their specific shape, which relates to their tertiary and quaternity structures. When we discuss enzymes and inorganic catalysts, enzymes generally have a faster reaction rate, they work under much more mild conditions, they're more sensitive and more selective. And we think of an enzyme working like a lock and a key, where the lock is known as the enzyme, and then the key is known as the substrate. And only a certain key will open a certain lock. That's just like the interaction between an enzyme and a substrate. Only a certain enzyme can catalyze a certain substrate reaction. So the, that catalytic activity depends upon the tertiary shape of the enzyme. And any slight change in that shape can render that enzyme inoperative. So a reactant molecule known as the substrate is maneuvered into the site of the enzyme and then there's some interactions that take place. So the substrate needs to have a collision with the enzyme and it needs to enter into the active site. There are some bonds formed between the enzyme and the substrate that lowers the activation, of, activation energy of the reaction and then the reaction takes place. The products then leave the active site of the enzyme. So that selectivity arises because of the shape of the and of the functional groups that are present in the enzyme. And those interactions form the lock and the key setup. The four types of interactions that an enzyme and, and substrate can have are dispersion force interactions, where we have non-polar groups interacting with each other. We could have ionic interactions between two positively charged ions. We could have iron dipole interactions between an iron and then a carboxy group, for instance, which has a dipole. And we could have some hydrogen bonding interactions between the substrate and the enzyme. If we have a look at that diagram on the left-hand side, we can see all of those different types of interactions. Here we have the dispersion force interactions, the iron dipole interactions, the hydrogen bond interactions, and the ionic interactions, all helping the shape of this enzyme react with that specific substrate. So a change that destroys the biological activity of a protein or an enzyme is called denaturing. The things that can denature a protein or an enzyme are increased temperature, a change in pH, or the addition of heavy metals. And what happens is that interaction between those Z groups breaks apart and it forms like a long strand, and then coagulation is where it quickly alters its final shape. Enzymes generally are efficient only between a small pH range. If we look at the first graph, we can see how the temperature changes, as the temperature changes, how the rate of reaction of an enzyme is changed. And we can see that at 40 degrees, it has its maximum efficiency. After that, it starts to become denatured. But if we have a look at the low temperature section, low temperatures just render enzymes inactive. Low temperatures don't denature enzymes. So just be careful with that. Here we have the rate of reaction and pH, and we can see that at extremes of pH, the enzyme is denatured, and it only works at a very specific pH level. If we start to add heavy ions 
to enzymes or proteins. That starts to alter the structure because those heavy metal ions have affinities for the SH group, which is part of the cysteine amino acid. And they change the tertiary structure of the protein or the enzyme, which alters the shape. So the rate of reaction of an enzyme catalyzed reaction follows the same principles as those for other reactions. And we can draw a rate graph to explain what's happening. So at part A of the graph, we have a low substrate concentration and virtually every collision between the substrate and the enzyme will result in a reaction. As the substrate concentration begins to increase, we have less enzymes left over. And so that there will be some collisions between a substrate and an enzyme that already, already has a substrate in it. So the rate of reaction will start to decrease. At point C, we reach the maximum rate, which is called the Vmax, and that's because the enzyme is saturated with substrates. We've just got none that are free, so we have to wait for the reaction to occur to free up some more. Electrophoresis is an analytical technique that's used to create a protein fingerprint, and it's often used in DNA fingerprinting and protein fingerprinting. Basically what it does is it allows us to separate sections of a protein according to their mass and charge. And this separation of the proteins allows us to build up a fingerprint which could be used in DNA analysis. A couple of the problems with this method is we need to add a dye to get them to fluoresce so we can see them because they're colourless. We could also add radioactive probes and use a device to measure the radioactivity and we can shine lasers on them. But electrophoresis is a technique used to separate sections of proteins. As we discussed in the last video, amino acids are Zwitter ions and their charge depends upon the pH of the solution they're in. As there are a number of amino acids in side chains, they could be acidic or basic. And we can separate amino acids based on their net electrical charge when they're placed in a buffer solution. Now an amino acid is neutral at a point called its isoelectric point. And its isoelectric point, you can find those on the data book. Basically, if something is in an acidic solution or a basic solution, it will have an overall charge, either positive or negative. And depending upon the buffer, buffer solution, those amino acids will move towards a terminal that is either positively charged or negatively charged, allowing us to separate them. So we can separate these protons due to their charge, but also their size. Smaller amino acids will move more quickly than larger amino acids. Another technique for separating amino acids is using paper chromatography. But since the amino acids are colourless, we need to add a chemical called ni niedrin, which gives them a purple colour. And that's a, something that you need to know and remember. Niedrin changes those amino acids to purple, it dyes them. We can then calculate what is called the RF value by looking at the distance moved by the amino acid or the component divided by the distance moved by the solvent from the origin. So our origin is where we've placed the spot. The distance moved by the solvent is how far up the bit of paper the solvent travels. And then we look at how far the component has moved and we just do a simple division or keep it as a fraction. If we run a experiment under the same conditions as some other experiments, we can then determine the identity of amino acid by simply looking at those RF values under the same conditions. So we might have an unknown and a number of standards as well. So let's look, look at an example of electrophoresis. A mixture of five amino acids is separated by gel electrophoresis in a buffer solution of pH 6. Draw the finished gel after the amino acids have been separated. So what you need to do here is refer to the data book for the isoelectric point. So if you refer to the data book, you'll see that Cysteine has an isoelectric point of 5.1, glycine is 6, histine is 7.6, lysine is 9.7, and phenylamine is 5.5. Now, if we've got a buffer solution of 6, 
Some of these things will feel like they're in an acidic solution. Some of them will feel like they're in a basic solution. Remember, if something feels like it's in an acidic solution, it's going to have a positive charge. If it feels like it's in a basic solution, it's going to have a negative charge. So, a pH of 6, if we have an isoelectric point of 5.1, that is going to feel like it is in a basic solution. It's got a pH, its isoelectric point is lower, 5.1, the pH is 6, so that means it's going to feel negatively charged. The other ones I've gone through and done as well. What we need to do now is to draw the finished gel. So we'll look at one, the charge, and then two, the molecular mass. The greater the molecular mass, the slower that they will move from the origin. So, the sample will be placed in the middle of the plate, and then it will separate according to its mass and charge. So here is my sample. Now glycine was neutral, it had an isoelectric point of pH 6, so it won't move anywhere. It's not negative or positive, it would exist as its Zwitter ion. The things that would move towards the negative electrode are the positively charged Zwitter ions. Now lysine, lysine has a smaller molar mass than histine, so that means it will move further towards the negative electrode. The ones that move towards the positive electrode, well we have phenylalanine, which is, has a heavier molar mass than cysteine, so it will move a smaller amount. And this is what our finished dye would look like. Okay, volume 2B, some top tips. When we talk about enzyme, it's all about shape, shape, shape. When we talk about the interactions, we talk about the charge, and the size, when we talk about electrophoresis, we talk about the charge and the size of the amino acids. Thanks for watching guys, don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you 